Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 452 of the podcast and it's Friday 27th of September 2019 as I record this and scarily we are almost into October and you know when it's starting to get towards the end of the year because uh, you start seeing Christmas stuff arriving and I've been seeing people, uh, shops and stuff putting Christmas things up which is disturbing. (laughs) <laughs> so today on the show, I'm talking to Dana Kay about PR and author branding and why you might not get spike trackable book sales from PR publicity, uh, but actually press coverage can build your brand and your authority and your reputation, and it can lead to opportunities you might not have had otherwise. And also we talk about changes uh, that have come in book marketing since we've both been in marketing for sort of a decade now. Here's a little taster. The truth is, is when you meet a read when authors meet readers in person, it forms a bond and it forms a loyalty that's really difficult to replicate online. So anytime you're able to either get yourself out there to meet your readers or to tap into somebody else's readership or someone else's market, you will reach a new set of readers. So that interview is coming up. Well, in book marketing news Lots happening this week. First, big uh, big announcement from Kobo Writing Life. They have announced direct audio upload. And I'm, I'm really pleased about this. It's something that they've been talking about for at least a year. And I'm very happy with what I've seen. Uh, it's available there on your dashboard. If you do uh, already work with Kobo Writing Life, just log in, go to your dashboard, and you'll see a new audiobooks tab. And I actually... I had been going through different things for the successful author mindset, and I'm going to be putting that directly onto KWL this week. So why is this exciting? Because, of course, you can go into Kobo Audio through other services like Find Away Voices. Well, uh, I'm... (sighs) I have a couple of reasons why I'm going to go direct um, with Kobo. One, I'm an independent. I love going direct as much as possible. And uh, generally, if you go direct, as you will with this, you get better royalties, you know, slightly better royalties. So that's one reason. Two, uh, you will be able to reach potentially other markets that Kobo does um things with. So what they, what Kobo's business model is, and it's very smart, I think, is they do partnerships with companies <laughs> that don't want to work with Amazon. <laughs> so for example, walmart.com in the US has audiobooks from Kobo in their stores. You can buy little downloadable cards and things, which is very cool. Uh, Overdrive is a uh, co- sister company to Kobo, owned both owned by Rakuten, Japanese e-commerce company. And again, yes, you can get to many of these opportunities through Findaway. But one of the things you will get is pre-orders, which is cool, and multi-currency pricing. Now, I think this is a huge deal because at the moment, well, you can't set your price on ACX, but you can set your price on Findaway, but only in US dollars. And so this to me is a true global wide audiobook solution. You have to have pricing in multi-currency if you're going to compete in other markets, um, because many currencies, if you just translate them directly from US dollars, they are out of reach of listeners in that market. So that's another reason. Also, they will be developing a promotional tab, hopefully a separate tab or within the same promotions tab, uh, promotions for audiobooks. And uh, I think long term, as you know about these things, so I'm excited. I will, so I guess from now on, I will be using ACX plus KWL Audio plus Find Away Voices uh, for going wide with audio audio. Things change very quickly around here, don't they? (laughs) So that's one. Secondly, uh, Vellum, a lot of people are going, oh no, what's happened? Basically, Vellum has uh, shifted their 
formatting to produce a Kindle specific EPUB file instead of a Mobi. And uh, technically, you don't need to worry too much about this stuff. You can still upload anything from Vellum to um, Amazon and to the other stores with normal EPUB. But uh, if you use if you want to give books to your readers, many people are confused because, of course, we've been using Mobis for, again, a decade. Uh, so what is really interesting is that uh, BookFunnel have announced that they can change a vellum Kindle EPUB to a Mobi. So I'm in a bundle this month. I'll come back to that later and very happy to um, be using BookFunnel to change my vellum files into Mobi. As ever, if that sounds too techy for you, don't worry about it. You probably don't use it anyway. <laughs> but for those of you who do, uh, that will be useful. Again, links in the show notes. And thanks as ever to BookFunnel for being a very useful company and to Vellum for keeping up with changes in tech. And that's some of the reasons they have made that change. Right, futurist segment this week. I was just giddy with excitement this week because... There, uh, basically, Amazon uh, did a big tech event and announced a whole load of stuff for Alexa. But one of the things they announced, and this is huge if you have been following my AI development, I really didn't think this would happen so soon, but it has happened. Samuel L. Jackson, yes, very cool. Samuel L. Jackson is now available on Alexa for you to interact with. And this will be a paid Alexa skill of some kind. But it says, and this is quoting from The Guardian, The Jackson feature will allow users of Alexa-enabled devices to interact with an AI version of the actor developed using the company's neural text-to-speech technology. Jackson is not the first celebrity to feature on Alexa, but previous celebrity voice features have relied upon pre-recorded audio. This is a big change. Uh, As far as I know, this is the first voice voice synth AI for the voice tech stuff. I would love to know how much they have paid to license his voice because that's basically what they've done. It says, you know, this is based on the neural text-to-speech technology. So they've taken the many, many hours of Samuel L. Jackson's voice and they have created a voice synth and you can interact with that voice synth AI through Alexa. And just genius choice of voice because his is so recognisable and uh, there is a swearing setting apparently so you can either have one that swears a lot or not. Um, They've said more voices will be added in 2020. This is voice licensing. I would just, I love to get a look at this contract because it means, to me, this means that Samuel L. Jackson's voice is now out of his control. (laughs) But maybe as I have said on this show and have thought about is, I would rather, I mean, it's going to be out of control anyway. Um, His voice is available everywhere. And if your voice is out there and someone wants to deep fake it, they can. So why not get paid for what is licensed? Um, And this is why I'm interested in licensing my voice as well. Uh, But this is, I think this is fantastic. Also, the press release says... um, Thanks to new neural text-to-speech technology, Alexa is becoming more emotive and expressive. She can sound excited and sense when you're frustrated. And this emotional level of AI speech is exactly what we need in order to have voice synth uh, narration. So, yeah, I mean, go back and listen to episode 431 on how AI is disrupting things and what my predictions are. Now, I, I've that was a prediction for a decade, the next decade. I said, this was this is what's going to happen in the next 10 years. And uh, already quite a lot of things are happening. <laughs> so my aim is to revisit that every um, July. Uh, so that post I did 1st of July 2019. And I will be doing that every year. And of course, I'll always be updating you in the uh, beginning of, of the show. So yeah, crazy times. Um, Amazon also announced lots of other things at this hardware event. They launched the Alexa Smart Ring, uh, which is what they call the the loop. Um, They also have smart glasses and smart earbuds. Now, the earbuds, I'm sure you've seen, if you don't have them already, you've seen people walking. They're, you know, Bluetooth earbuds that are not wired. They don't have a wire. And I switched to using the Apple earbuds and the Apple Watch. 
oh, a month or so ago, I think. Um, I love my watch and I have found myself, incre- and I love the earbuds as well. I love having um, no wires. It's just brilliant. I am increasingly asking Siri things through the watch and I didn't really do that with my phone. So having the watch and the earbuds has moved me into using the voice assistant a lot more. So I I get why Amazon's done this. You can essentially use the earbuds with the glasses or the ring and or the ring to do what the Apple Watch and the earbuds do, which is you can use Alexa, but also All of these things work with Siri and Google Assistant, which is so smart because if you just have one ecosystem, then people who don't use that ecosystem won't buy your hardware. (laughs) So um, they also announced lots of other devices like Smart Oven and loads of other stuff. But I thought this was interesting for us because, you know, I'm very focused on voice and voice search. And you have to, even if you're not doing this stuff yourself, you have to watch other people's behavior and how they are finding things on the internet or how they're finding a podcast, how they're finding an audiobook. Um, because, of course, I can be playing um, music or a podcast or an audiobook through my watch, which is tethered to the phone. Um, and I, I also pay with my Apple Watch as well now. So I don't have to get out my phone, which is has been a real shift in my behavior. So I'm kind of using the watch and the earbuds as opposed to the phone. It's a, it's a screenless relationship. I don't, and I don't have to type stuff. Um, I am. And also when I'm using my phone, I'm dictating my texts a lot more. So I want us to keep an eye on the changing in behavior because it will change creation and it will also change a search. And, uh, we want to continue to be found in this kind of voice search world. So my personal update this week, well, I finished the edits on Productivity for Authors. I'm recording the audiobook. Uh, It will be available in a special bundle, which I'll announce next week, and then will be available in all the usual places, formats, etc. from 1st of December 2019. I'm going to put that up for pre-order soon, but you will be able to get the ebook in a special bundle coming next week. So that's why I did that earlier. I've also been writing loads on my next nonfiction, audio for authors, audiobooks, podcasting and voice technologies. And this is based on everything. Like I've been reviewing things I've been learning for a decade. You know, I've been podcasting for 10 years and the last 18 months with audiobook narration and voice tech. And this is an unexpected book. I did not expect this book. I thought I was going to do a course, but then with my uh, shoulder issues, which have calmed down a lot, by the way, uh, uh, When I learn about a topic, when I spend a lot of time learning about it, I want to write a book. I feel like the best way for me to embed my knowledge is to write a book because then I figure out how to teach it and I can help other people as well. So, uh, and I've done this, every single one of my nonfiction books has come out of something I've learned. So that productivity book, I never felt ready to write one before because I didn't feel productive. Uh, I know that might be a surprise, but I didn't. But this year I've really turned a corner and feel like I'm super productive. Um, That's because I've made some changes, which of course are in the book. Uh, I will no doubt tell you more about it on the show. But the audio book, um, the audio for authors book, I just feel like this is the right time for for me to write that book. There's very little available for authors at this point with um, the changes that have happened. So uh, I'm very excited about that. And I, again, I didn't expect to write it, but I really want to get that out there. And this week I have a launch. So as this goes out, uh, Public Speaking for Authors, Creatives and Other Introverts, the second edition is out in ebook, paperback, large print, hardback and audiobook narrated by me. And uh, that's launching 1st of October 2019. And it will be everywhere, all the usual places. You should also be able to request it through your library or your local bookstore if you want to support independence. And uh, of course, if you do try and order stuff in places and they can't get it, let me know. Uh, So again, sort of circling back on why I write nonfiction. I wrote that book, the first edition, when I you know, was starting to be paid for public speaking and I really wanted to embed everything I'd learned about public speaking. 
and rewriting it and updating it was was very worthwhile. I, I feel the book is needed now more than ever. And a lot of the principles feed into the audiobook as well, because if you learn to do public speaking, it will really help with doing podcasting and and other things. So uh, just to let you know, uh, if you are trying to decide whether public speaking is for you, I mean the book. (laughs) So are you an author or creative preparing for success? I hope so. Do you want to learn to speak effectively in front of an audience, whether that is... um, Yeah, I mean, all successful creatives have to speak and present in public. It might be a festival, a podcast, a radio show, uh, or as part of earning another stream of income. But of course, you don't have to be like Tony Robbins, bouncing around and booming and being larger than life. You just have to be you and tell your story in your own way. So in this book, I share everything I know as a professional speaker, author and introvert. It includes the practicalities of speaking as well as the mindset issues like anxiety and fear of it and how to deal with that, plus the business side if you want to make money with uh, speaking. So you can find the book in all the usual places or all the links at thecreativepen.com forward slash speaking book. So useful stuff. I am very excited about this. I can't tell you how excited I am, or I guess I'm about to tell you. (laughs) But I want you to think about what are the top 10 books for writers about story structure and story design? Who do you think of in that category? Now, of course, uh, Robert McKee's story is probably there. The Story Grid by Sean Coyne, maybe Save the Cat and some of the other structural books. But definitely in that top 10 will be The Anatomy of Story, 22 Steps to Becoming a Master Storyteller by John Truby. And I have the paperback, it's well thumbed, and I also have it in ebook, and I've highlighted highlighted that and I've read it several times. It is a Bible for story creators in the novel format and also for screenwriters. Uh, John Truby is referenced by so many people and uh, he is a real expert at story structure. So I am more than excited to announce that John is going to do a webinar for the Creative Pen audience. And uh, I was like, oh, I'm very excited about this. Um, so I'm definitely going to be there. I will be taking a lot of notes and I will hope you're going to join me. So the topic is going to be story for money. And John has developed this webinar. Uh, he's going to share the first rule of writing a best-selling novel, plus share one of his favourite techniques that can make or destroy a novel. And also the one thing that will immediately get a reader to want to binge read your whole series. Uh, John has forgotten more about story structure than the rest of us <laughs> have learned. So you can come to truby.com, T-R-U-B-Y.com forward slash pen, P-E-N-M, and you will be able to sign up. The webinar will be on Thursday, 10th of October, 2019, 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. UK. And of course, if you can't make it live, register anyway and you will get the replay within 24 hours of the event. Sign up for your free place at truby.com, T-R-U-B-Y.com forward slash pen, P-E-N-N, links in the show notes. So yeah, I, I am excited. And I'm going to send an email out, hopefully on my list and everything. And because, yeah, I'm excited about this. I've done lots of webinars over the years, mostly for book marketing things. And I, I don't even know if I've ever done one on craft. So this is, this is super exciting. Yes, 10th of October anyway, truby.com forward slash pen. So thanks for all your emails and tweets this week. Uh, Jonelle Serra says, I always like the podcast, but this one hit home more than usual. Uh, A retreat leader writer was the interview I needed uh, with Jen Loudon. Fantastic. Emily Robertson says, based on advice from the Creative Pen and others, I got basic equipment to record myself. And today I recorded the first chapter of Lifestyles of Gods and Monsters as practice for reading aloud. And y'all, it's not easy but I did it. Well done, Emily. And sometimes it's a bit like everything, you know, the first time you do it, you prepare and you do all this stuff and it's like, you just have to do it. And yes, you might well have deleted that first (laughs) go, but you did it. And next time it will be easier. 
Uh, Tenzin says, love the show with Jen Loudon on self-care and writing. I am into meditation, particularly Tibetan Buddhism, and I can relate to everything the two of you were talking about, health and self-care. Thank you, Tenzin. And finally, just one more. Uh, Melanie Glinsman says, spending the afternoon catching up on podcasts while cleaning my apartment. Listening to podcasts is a great way to make cleaning, which I hate, more tolerable. Fantastic. Thanks for listening, Melanie. So today's show is sponsored by Publish Drive, and I'll play a word from them in a minute. Uh, just so you know, I use Publish Drive to reach Google Play, the Chinese ebook store Dung Dung, as well as Eastern European stores that other distributors don't reach. And of course, they also distribute to all the usual retailers if you want to use them for everything. So I use them as part of my wide strategy. And uh, last week, they announced a new subscription software as a service model, where you get 100% royalties as well as access to promotional tools and other things. So well worth checking them out uh, if you are going wide as one of your options. So we have so much choice now as indies and I love having a European company as well taking things global. I love you Americans and Canadians but it's also great to have European based um, company which also has offices in the US Uh, but Kinga is coming up shortly to tell you more. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing of the show. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thank you to everyone supporting the show on Patreon, whether you've been doing it for years or whether you are new. So thanks to new patrons, Liz Pearson Mann, Maria, Claire, Arinetta, Pamela Cook, Heather Hollick and Joni Jeffries. I really do appreciate your support on Patreon. Like the tweets and emails, it demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. And you can support the show for just a couple of dollars a month, uh, less than a coffee a month, and you'll get the extra monthly Q&A audio, including the backlist. So you can learn lots more via audio. Uh, You can support the show. (laughs) Don't forget the link. (laughs) Hopefully you can say it along with me now. Uh, You can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. And of course, you are all going to know when I'm using my AI voice synth to do the introduction (laughs) because it won't be full of mistakes and giggling. (laughs) Right, here's Publish Drive and then we'll get on to the interview. Hey, creatives. I'm Kinga the founder of Publish Drive. As you can hear, I'm originally from Hungary, but eventually went global with my team based in the United States, helping authors like you achieve indie success. Do you want to double your online sales? We support you to achieve that. Publish Drive will get your book to over 400 stores and thousands of libraries. Also to hard to access markets, like Google Play and China to reach more than a billion potential readers exclusively with Publish Drive. Sounds exciting. I shared a few more ways we help you in these publish more and very less. First, Publish Drive is the only self-publishing platform where you keep 100% of your royalties. Maximize your income with Publish Drive by keeping all of your royalties. Your success is 100% yours. Second, we support you to promote your books. We develop tools around book promotions to boost your sales in stores. Also, we make publishing easy for you so you can convert ebooks for free, track sales with cool analytics, and split royalties with your co authors. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. And the cool thing? you access all the tools you need in one single dashboard. Sounds too good to be true. Why don't you publish your book for free today? Start collecting 100% of your royalties forever. See why 10,000s of authors are with Publish Drive on publishdrive.com slash pen. Happy publishing!
Dana Kay is the author of Your Book, Your Brand and the Personal Brand Workbook. She's also a podcaster at Branding Outside the Box and the founder of K Publicity, a full service public relations agency specializing in publishing and entertainment. Hi, Dana. Hi, Joanna. Thank you so much for having me here. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. So first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you got into publicity and marketing. Well, I'll give you the abbreviated version, but (laughs) I, in college, I was a creative writing major and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Did I want to, you know, there's an idea of moving to Prague and writing the great American novel um, and bartending, or did I want to do something else? And I found uh, through my college, a freelance applications class that taught you how to do all types of writing, interviews, reviews, grant writing, all types of things. And I really enjoyed that. So I started freelancing and I was primarily doing book reviews. So I was writing for the Chicago Sun-Times and Time Out and Crime Spree and Bitch Magazine and all kinds of things. And so basically anyone that paid me to read and write about it, I, I did it. And that was fantastic. But I was seeing the writing on the wall. I saw that the Chicago Tribune had filed for bankruptcy. The Sun-Times was not far behind, that you know staffers were getting laid off. And I just saw the writing on the wall that my, my job may not be super secure. And I gave it some thought about what I really loved about reviewing and why did I like it. And really what it was is I enjoyed pairing readers with books that they may have never heard of. I reviewed a lot of small press books, and I really wanted to give light to books that were really, really good, but maybe aren't going to be on the front table of Barnes & Noble or have a huge ad in the New York Times. And so that's what I enjoyed. And I thought, okay, what are the other ways I can do that? And of course, publicity and marketing came to mind. I you know, had been pitched by publicists all the time. So I knew how to write a pitch. I knew press materials. As a freelancer, I had to pitch my editors. So I knew how to pitch a magazine editor or a newspaper editor. So I thought, okay, publicity. And I knew a lot about social media, so maybe marketing. And I started applying for jobs at the publishers, but publishing is mainly in New York. And I'm a proud Chicagoan. I did not want to move. So I was applying, but not really, like I wasn't doing a great job. You know, when you're not your heart isn't in something, so you Mm. don't do it very well. (laughs) And so I had been at a writer's conference in my reviewer capacity, and I was speaking with an author, Jamie Frevoletti, who's a thriller author, and she, her first book, Running from the Devil, was slated to come out that spring. And she was saying that she was going to hire an outside publicist, an independent publicist. And I said, oh, I deal with publicists all the time. Make sure that they always follow up. Make sure they give you lead time. Make sure they don't send packages of glitter. You know, all those. I was giving her all this advice of what she should look for. And finally, she just turns to me and she said, do you want to do it? Should you just do this? <laughs> and I said, maybe. Let's talk about it. And so the, the after the writing conference and we got breakfast and we just hashed out a plan and said, okay, this is what Harper's, it was Harper Collins. This is what Harper's doing let's see where I can fill in the gaps. And we did a lot of really cool things. And that's what really spurred off the the publicity company. Wow. There's so many things that I want to follow up on. First of all, I got to ask you, did you end up going to Prague and writing any fiction? <laughs> um, I did live in Prague. I studied abroad in Prague and I was writing there. Um, I got a few short stories published over there and then I was freelancing too. Um, so, I mean, you can write from anywhere. And yeah. although it was very different back, this was in 2005, 2004. So this was, I mean, internet cafes and spotty Wi-Fi at the, at the, um, pension and the, yeah, so it was a little bit different. So the original plan was to, I was in Prague. I loved it. It was super cheap. They hadn't gone on the Euro. Um, so everything was just so cheap. And like my, I was like, okay, I'm going to finish up school. I had one more semester. I came back to finish up school and I was going to move back. I had an apartment lined up. I was going to freelance. You can make a really good life as a freelancer there. Cause they, I think my apartment I got was like $200 a month or something. Mm. Um, and I came back. Um, but while I was back in Chicago, I met my wife. <laughs> and so <laughs> life took a turn and I decided not to return to Prague and, and see, uh, see what happened there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's brilliant. I just wanted to follow up on that one. Okay. So, um, 
Let's talk about branding because, and we're going to, I want to come back to the Jamie Frevoletti story a bit later, mm-hmm. um, but let's talk about branding first. So you, obviously your books, um, you know, your books are about branding, You your podcast is about branding and you talk a lot about it, but I feel that many authors don't necessarily get what an author brand is and why it's important. So could you talk a bit about that? Absolutely. So you're you're 100 percent right that there's a lot of confusion. And some people think brand is your is your pen name. Brand is your logo. It's it's really and and those are parts of it. But I think the main foundation of your brand is who you are and what you do. Like that's the essence of a personal brand for an author brand. It's who you are and what you write. And I think that if we can get clarity on that, it takes the risk out for the reader. So the reason that James Patterson and Nora Roberts and these authors and Lee Child and all so many other household names do so well is because, not because of their name necessarily, but because of what they deliver in each book. It's a safe bet. You know that Reacher is going to blow into town, solve some problem, maybe get a girl, and then blow out of town and be fine. And that feels safe uh, with Nora Roberts and her romance novels. Like, you know that there's going to be obstacles, but they're going to have a happy ending. And so it takes the risk away from the reader. If you're investing four to five hours of your time, if it's a hardcover, 25 bucks, we want to know that we're going to like it. And so by having a really strong author brand and being really clear on who you are and what you write, you're able to convey that to potential readers in a way that makes them feel safe and more inclined to take a essentially a risk when purchasing and reading your book. Right. And what are your thoughts on someone like me who mm-hmm. uses two different brands? Well, I think that you have, we had just talked on my podcast recently about that you have very different audiences, that the audience of writers, authors, aspiring writers is not necessarily the audience for your fiction. And so it's very clear First of all, it's very clear from your books. I know which ones are fiction and which ones are nonfiction without even reading the description. I know from the visuals, the title, the, you know, the book covers, the website pages, all of that. Like I know which ones are which. And but by targeting a different audience, I think that you're speaking, you're messaging and you're speaking very clearly to who your audience is. So if you're at a writer's conference, you are with your Joanna Penn hat and talking to writers. If you're at a library event or a book festival, you have your JF Penn hat on and you're speaking very differently. So I think it's that it's it's okay to have two different two different lanes, let's say, and just being aware of the audience. I mean, writers, you guys all know you always all have a sense of audience. You think about your readers when you write. And so having that sense of audience should translate not just in the writing but also when you're speaking to people about you and your work. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so let's um, assume that people understand what their brand is. So then there's um, sort of PR and marketing. And I think a lot of people get confused as to what PR might be, um, as opposed to something like pay-per-click advertising. So Mm -hmm. could you maybe talk about the types of PR that that you think and, and why they might be different? Sure. I know my job is so confusing, isn't it? I talk about branding, <laughs> branding and publicity and marketing. And yes, I joke that my in-laws like don't really know what I do, um, <laughs> but I'm glad I can clarify it here. So PR, to me, public relations is the overall, your relationship with the public at its core. So that could take a variety of forms. So to us, our main pillars that we work with is publicity, marketing, and then community in-person outreach. So publicity is earned media coverage. That's other people talking about your book. So it's a book review. It's a blogger or an Instagrammer posting a photo of your book and talking about it. It's earned, meaning you're not paying for it. It's someone else talking about it. It's also something that you don't have much control over. So we send books to reviewers. We send books and pitch radio producers or television producers but it's very hit and miss. It's in their court, whether or not that runs. And even if they say it's going to run, if some breaking news thing happens, which has happened, mm-hmm. then things may get canceled and you know things may not go. So 
the positive part of publicity is that you have it holds more weight. There's more clout because if someone else is recommending your book, that holds a little bit more weight than you talking about your book. But it's also out of your control. On the flip side, marketing is how you talk about your book. So marketing is completely controlled. You control the message. You control when things run. For example, email marketing, if you send an email on this date, that's when it's going out, breaking news, whatever or not, unless I guess there's a huge server <laughs> downage at Gmail. But I think that if you are if you are sending the message, you're controlling the message and you're placing it there, that falls under marketing. So advertising is a part of marketing. Advertising is paid, you know, paid placements, but there's other forms of marketing like your, you know, your BookBub site or your BookBub page, your Amazon author page. Those are all forms of marketing because it's how you are talking about your book. Mm. And for us, the community outreach is kind of a blend of both. I know some people think of it as publicity, some as marketing, but doing bookstore events, doing speaking engagements, doing partnerships with corporations or nonprofits, other boots on the ground, grassroots initiatives are something that we tend to focus on for most of our authors. I think that in the digital age, it's easy to feel like, oh, well, I can just make all these arrangements online. I can talk to my readers online. I don't need to leave my house. I can be... J.D. Salinger-esque. Uh, but the truth is, is when you meet a read, when authors meet readers in person, it forms a bond and it forms a loyalty that's really difficult to replicate online. So anytime you're able to either get yourself out there to meet your readers or to tap into somebody else's readership or someone else's market, you will reach a new set of readers. So some examples of this, uh, we work with an author, Greg Hurwitz, whose main character, Evan Smoke, is a vodka, let's say connoisseur. Sometimes I say snob, but vodka <laughs> snob. Um, and he mentions different vodkas in the book. So part of the marketing efforts is that when people sign up for his newsletter, they get a comprehensive guide to all of Evan's vodka. It's what makes it different, where it's from, and where you can get it. And then one of the vodka companies that is mentioned in the book, we had reached out to, they, I think they actually reached out to us and they sponsored a part of Greg's book tour. So they came out to various locations, did vodka tastings. They also Specs, which is a liquor store in Texas, like the biggest liquor chain in Texas, I think. And they actually have huge displays of Dash Vodka there. And they had like a photo of Greg <laughs> talking about like Evan Smoke's favorite. And it was like as featured in the New York Times bestselling series. So like that's a whole new audience that, he, you know, people going into the liquor store aren't necessarily the same people going into the bookstore, but they may think it's cool that this vodka was featured in a book. So that may get them to buy the vodka. It also may get them to think about buying the book. So those sorts of partnerships really are what fire me up because it's unique. It's different. Um, a lot of the times if it's a nonprofit, like they're excited that we're going to help them fundraise. If it's a corporation, they think it's like fun and interesting and something different. Um, so that's the other piece that I always encourage authors to think about is like, what can you do to get out into the community, either to meet your readers or to expand your readership? Oh, I love the idea. And now I'm thinking about, yeah, I drink gin. I really like gin. So I'm now thinking, oh, I really should write that into your book. You should. I get, <laughs> so what's really lovely about, so I get all of Greg's mail to our office. And so what's really lovely is most of the vodka companies, if they're sending him vodka, will send one for me too. And it's <laughs> lovely. Although he's more of a bourbon drinker. So we always said, oh, I wish I made him drink bourbon. Drink but it was out of character. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. But what I what I think is interesting is, I mean, obviously not everyone is going, you know, not everyone's a big name author. They're going to get a partnership like that. But it's thinking about things that might be different. Um, and in terms of pitching and what's different, so many uh, people pitch me for this podcast and they say, sure. uh, I wrote a book. Can I come on your podcast? And I imagine that that's what a lot of newspapers and magazines get from authors as well, which is, I wrote a book, interview me or promote me. Um, so why is that not a good pitch? And what is a, what is a better idea for when we pitch this type of thing? I know. I always tell people, you know, there's a lot of, like I, a lot of the authors say like, well, you're a, you do this for a living. You have the contacts. Like, so you, 
so you can do things that I can't. But look, I started with no experience, like no, no, I mean, the publications in that I wrote for knew me, but no one else knew me. The difference is, is that by crafting a pitch that shows symbiosis, that shows that you are helping them just as much as they are helping you and really showing that you did your research, that it is a good fit, you're going to stand out like eons above the rest. Like I, I'm sure you see, Joanna, like you see so many pitches and it's like, hi, comma, like there's no name. <laughs> like we would like to be on your podcast. Like there's no, it's a completely a canned email. Like we forget that just by doing things a little bit better, you're automatically going to be above the fold because there's so much schlock being pitched for any out for any type of media outlet. And so what I would tell authors is that you don't need to pitch hundreds of outlets. Like I would, and we don't, frankly, like we, we tend to focus on 30 to 40, maybe 50, depending on the book. But we really look at the ones that we think are going to be a good fit. Like, sure, everyone would love to sit on the couch and talk to Alan, or everyone would love to have uh, Hoda like hold up their book or end the day show. So like, we get that, but really taking a look at, is this the best fit for this for this program? And if it is, then crafting a pitch that demonstrates why it's a good fit. Saying, I saw that you had this author on your show. We write similar books. Here's why mine's a little different. And so it's, again, similar, like it's, they're both romance novels, but a little different because you don't want to have the exact same person on the show. For podcasts, I mean, a lot of it is how are you, I'm sure you see this too, like how are you going to serve their audience? Like what are you bringing to the table? Because a podcaster, their job is not to showcase you. Like that's not what it is. They want to serve their audience. So the more you can show how you fit into their existing coverage, how you are the perfect person or book for their outlet or how you're going to serve their audience, they're going to take second, third and looks and maybe even book you. Because I think that so many people are just out there to serve themselves. And so if you can create this relationship, create this relationship with media contacts where you are helping them, but also they help you, you're going to have a better, better odds of getting the placement. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and it's funny because when I started writing, uh, I and with my first book, I got on national TV in Australia. I got in, um, you know, newspapers, and because I did all that, I did all that pitching. And what I found, and it was successful. Um, but what I found is that they were far more interested in the personal story behind the book. So at the time I'd written a book on career change and they wanted mm -hmm. to know about why I was miserable in my job. And, um, you know, and it also tied into this dream job on the barrier reef, which uh, was in the news mm -hmm. back then, like, you know, a decade ago. And I think that's why I've shied away from PR. And I, since then, I've kind of dipped my toe back in and the questions they asked me were too personal. And I just didn't want I, there's lots of personal stuff in my fiction and nonfiction, but I didn't really want to talk about it in a more sensationalist way. So is, is that a, a fair comment that they always want more personal stories and you kind of have to be prepared for that? I think it depends on the book. I think what writer, a couple of things, I think what writers sometimes forget is that this is a, mis we are mysterious beings to other people. Right. Like I know a lot of authors complain when they get the question, like, where do you get your ideas? Like it's an annoying question because it comes so naturally to most authors. But most people don't have ideas like most people haven't written a book. They don't know how to get things published. Like it's a it's a mystery to them. It's also this kind of not living vicariously, but this voyeuristic trend towards wanting to learn more. And for you, like when you were leaving your job, how many people watching those shows are in jobs that they hate and need someone to give them permission to leave their job? And so I think it's not necessarily, it's, it really depends on the person and the book. But I do think a lot of the times readers and audience members are so interested in the person because this person has done something that they could never do. I mean, it's even why we read. I mean, if you think about reading thrillers, like I can have a front row seat to explosions and helicopter, you know, helicopter fights or whatever. 
And I don't have to actually go anywhere. I can travel to various, I can travel to the world and not leave my couch. And so I think it's the same, that same idea of readers want to experience something that they've never experienced. When they talk to authors, it's the same thing. They want to know how they do it because they honestly don't get it. And for authors, you're like, I, I get ideas all the time. It's an annoying question, but other people genuinely don't know. They find it really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that if you're pitching something and you don't want to talk about personal stuff, I think it's really framed in the pitch. So sometimes what will happen is authors will just send their bio and then the public, the radio person, the producer or the journalist will see something in the bio that they'll pick out. So I also think that if you are done talking about something, then you need to stop talking about it from your marketing as well. So I talked to um, an author recently who's a cop and he writes a cop series and he says, I'm really sick of talking about cop stuff. Like I really am done. <laughs> and I said, well, why are you keep writing cop books? Like, <laughs> it makes him was, money. <laughs> well, I'm saying like, I just think that I understand that you're tired of talking about, I know it's your day job. Like I understand this, but if you write a story about being about a police officer and you are a police officer, then people will want to talk about it. If you write something totally different, you can include it. You don't have to include that you're a police officer in your bio, just make it more generic um, and just focus on the book. So I think it's, if there's something that you don't want to talk about publicly, then you have to be aware of what your marketing looks like because people will dig up all kinds of things. And mm. so just being aware of what, what types of bios, what you send to media, what you include in your press materials, what you put on your website should all be consistent with the things that you want to talk about. Yeah, that's, that is a good tip. And just really, yeah, focus on the thing you want to talk about. Like, for example, I, I love talking about the author mindset. So if people mm. um, ask me to come on and talk about some like career change, I don't talk about that much anymore. But I love talking about mindset, which brings me to another question, because many people w with indies, uh, with indie authors, we often will write a book and publish it. <laughs> and we won't mm -hmm. wait six months or a year. And most traditional publishing uh, PR happens because you have this time lag in, um, you know, they know the book's coming out and you're getting all this PR for the six months or whatever prior, or you're preparing or you're pitching for things that are months out. So can we um, pitch things for older books or does it always need to be the latest thing? So when you think about media outlets, Ultimately, these are news outlets. Like I know Women's World or Men's Health or whatever doesn't feel like a news outlet, but it is. So you have to think about what is the news hook? Like what is the timely hook? Why should they write about this now? For most fiction, the news hook is it just came out. Like that's the hook. So <laughs> if it's already been out, you you lose that hook. So for our, our nonfiction authors, we pitch media all the time because there's always various hooks and timely things that we can we can connect with on an ongoing basis. And they can just be the experts that speak about those topics with their byline, including she's the author of or the book. If a book speaks directly to something happening in politics or in culture or anything like that, we can pitch that all the time. So fiction, it's not that common that a, a novel would address that after publication. So I think if you think about what the news hook would be, and if there's possibility of news hooks later, then go by all means, you can just put it out and then try pitching. But if there's no news hook, it's going to be really difficult to get any sort of real media coverage for, for a book that's already been out. Um, another way to get around this is if you're doing events. So if you put the book out and then like, again, we keep coming back to thrillers and romance for whatever reason, but that's, it is what it is. So say you have a romance novel and it's been out for six months, but now you're doing a panel at a bookstore for Valentine's day and it's open to the public. You can pitch local media with the hook of that event is coming up. So you can also try to generate your own news hooks based on like the month, time of year, what's going on in culture and the zeitgeist. 
Yeah, that's cool. And I was just thinking as you were talking there, um, uh, a thriller, again, crime thriller author, mm-hmm. Christopher Peterson, who writes books set in Greenland. And when uh, President Trump um, started talking about buying Greenland, I mean, that would have been a great <laughs> hook for him to pitch, you know, author, you know, having lived in Greenland, author of Greenland crime thrillers, talking about that as a fiction author, that might have been a good hook for him. Um, mm-hmm. So that, I guess, is kind of news hacking as a a fiction writer, as you say, nonfiction, it's it's much, much easier. So I, I want to move on just to a sort of broad idea. I mean, you've given us some great examples, but you've been doing this now, um, you know, for what at least a, a decade, I guess. Yeah, just so we celebrated 10 years in February. Yeah, so there we go. So obviously, things have changed a lot in the last 10 years. So what, um, and I of, often feel like many authors still think things are the same as it used to be. <laughs> so what <laughs> what's changed over the last 10 years? And, and what are some of the things that might be working now that didn't and vice versa? We've gone through so many life cycles, like so many different things have like come and gone in this past 10 years. I think the main foundation is always the same. Where are readers getting their information? Where are they finding about new books and how can we meet them there? That that is the constant. And so the but where we meet them and where they're getting their information has changed. So when I first started, so like flashback to 2009, Facebook had just opened to the public. I had been in college, so I had a Facebook account where most people did not. They didn't know. And so I already knew about the platform and how to use the platform. And so that was really advantageous. So when I went public, I was able to coach our authors on this is Facebook, which is so weird to me to think about. (laughs) Um, And Twitter wasn't a thing. Like I had a Twitter. I was an early adopter of Twitter. And it, but it wasn't a thing. I was. I remember going into a meeting with Harper saying, this is Twitter, people follow you. And they're like, oh my God, follow you? That's so freaking creepy. And I'm just like, but now <laughs> it's so commonplace. Like that term, 10 years ago, that term follow was like stalker, was, you know, <laughs> a st- like a stalker, not a commonplace term for social media following. And so that, and, and also book bloggers weren't really a thing. So the term book blog or book blog or blog tour, I feel like was coined around 2009. And this stemmed out of my seeing what was happening in media where the book sections were being cut and people were getting laid off and there was like less and less coverage for books. And I know that when I was reviewing, I, I got a hundred books a month. And Mm -hmm. I obviously, I can't read a hundred books a month. I would love to, but I can't. And I also didn't have place to review all of them. So like I would read maybe 10 books a month, maybe more. Um, But I didn't have space to review all of them. So anyone that I read and that I enjoyed, but I couldn't place anywhere, I would put on my blog. And so I knew about the blogging community from there. And so I was like telling, I was telling again, this because Jamie was with Harper, which is my first foray into publicity. I kept telling them like, there's these people called book bloggers and they write about books and I'd like to send them some books. And they're like, oh, we only send to media outlets. And and like now we not only have book bloggers, I feel like have peaked, right? And Mm -hmm. now it's transitioning to something else. Um, But then it became like blog tours. It became commonplace to send to bloggers. And now it's even saturated and the blog market is in decline. And so now things are getting moving more towards podcasting, YouTube, social media, that sort of thing. So now we're shifting more of our focus towards books, podcasts, bookstagrammers, booktubers, all those sorts of people. Um, more so than bloggers. Most of them have a blog. It's just the traffic isn't coming from there. And so really it's the the premise, the idea that figuring out where your readers get your get their information and then just meeting them there, that's constant. So I, I believe that, you know, not every author needs to focus on YouTube. Not every author needs to be on Twitter. Not every author needs to um, have a podcast or pitch podcast. I think it's really, if you're readers are consuming in these areas, that's where you need to meet them and you should focus your energy there. So what's next on the horizon is kind of hard to say. I feel like we are kind of sliding back and this is completely anecdotal with no data. So (laughs) just throwing that out there. I feel like we're sliding back to people are getting screen fatigue um, and I, so I think there was like this big burst with eBooks where everyone and their mother had an e-reader. We were like loading up on eBooks. We were reading eBooks all the time. 
And now because we have social media, we have, you know, people are scrolling Instagram, all these things. I think we're getting a lot of screen fatigue, which is why I think podcasts and audiobooks are rising because we don't need to have those in front of a screen. I've also been noticing that print has been, I don't think it's going up a lot, but it's holding steady in a way that print is holding steady in a way that eBooks and other formats are not. Um, so like audiobooks are skyrocketing, print is kind of holding steady, eBooks are in decline. And so I think that, and I've also noticed that there's been a slew of magazines popping up mm. and I've seen more people reading like print magazines, um, myself included. Like I have a whole basket down uh, in our living room of like the, you know, the magazines I need to catch up on. But because um, I don't want to read screens at night. And I think people are becoming more attuned to not wanting to look at screens at night. And so if you don't want to look at a screen, how are you going to read? Well, it's going to be in either print or in your e-ink. And so I, I, I think we're going more towards that analog. I think people are shifting that way towards getting offline, not offline necessarily because podcasts are online, but not looking at screens. So I think my gut is telling me that, you know, focusing more on podcasts, pitching podcasts. Um, and like we discussed earlier that a lot of people are doing YouTube audio only. And so like, even if you are, don't want to do YouTube, like you could at least put your podcast up or snippets of your audiobook on YouTube just for listening as a sample. Um, cause a lot of people do listen only to YouTube. Um, so that's, that's my think where the trend is going is more towards p things that are not on screen. Yeah, totally. And it's so funny because in the last week, uh, my mum, who's 72, has got her first smartphone. Like she's had one of those burner phones at like $7. <laughs> um, I'm like, mum, you know, only terrorists use these burner phones. I mean, it's very... Terrorists <laughs> and, uh, terrorists <laughs> and the um, older, gen and the, what is it, the greatest generation or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she, and it's so funny because I said to my husband, okay, my mum has got a smartphone and Spotify. That means this has gone mainstream because she, she was like the last person to get a Kindle. And when she got a Kindle, I was like, okay, ebooks have, have hit the mainstream. And now I'm like, okay, Spotify, listening to music and podcasts on Spotify is, is a thing, you know, even mm -hmm. for people in, in their seventies. So this is, this is fascinating. It's definitely a change. So now I want to circle back. So you talked about Jamie Frevoletti, who I've met at Thriller Fest. She's, you know, wonderful author. Um, and so she had a traditional publishing deal and many authors, you know, do who have publicists, but you talk there about saying that she had a publicist with her publisher, but she also wanted to use an independent uh, PR. So for you, um, to use you. So I think this is interesting because so many indie authors say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I like being indie, but I don't want to do the marketing. So I'd yeah. like to get a traditional publishing deal because then they will do the marketing. So how, mm -hmm. how, tr like, where's the balance between an author getting a trad deal? Like how much marketing and what kinds of marketing do they do versus what the author still needs to do? Yeah, I, I hear this a lot too. Like they think that if they get a traditional deal that they can just, again, be the J.D. Salinger-esque and hole up in their house and write books and do nothing else. I, It's not true. I think that <laughs> if, look, if you're getting a seven figure deal, your publisher is going to do some stuff. If you're getting a six figure, five figure, four figure, it's really hit and miss. Let's not focus though right now on like what they do, but also why you would want to hire an outside publicist anyway, is that the publishers work, the, your in-house publicist doesn't work for you. They work for the publisher. Again, going back to that control thing, you have no control over what they do. Like they can decide, you know, we, we had, uh, we've had books where, you know, the, the, they are so, they're so jazzed. We're like, we're going to do all this stuff for the book. We're so excited. And then Barnes and Noble doesn't make a good buy. And then they start crunching numbers and they're like, oh, there's no way we, this book will be successful. Let's just cut and run. And then like nothing gets done. Um, publicists leave. I mean, like New York publicists, I believe the starting salary is $24,000 a year in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're like, they're overworked, they're underpaid. There is lots of churn. And so you know, I, we've had multiple authors who have book, who have in-house publicists who leave the company. There's no loyalty. They're, they leave a month before the person's book comes out, editors too, and 
they're at a loss. And so by hiring your own team, so by having an agent who to manage your career and by having an outside publicist, you're able to take more control and have some consistency with all of your publicity and marketing. You also have the ability, you know, to say, I kind of want to do this and have ideas and a public, an outside publicist can do that. Whereas an in-house person is beholden to their budget. So that's what I would think about is that if you're with a traditional publisher, that they're not loyal to you. They're not even probably loyal to their company. The individuals are not loyal to their company. So you have to think about building your team with people who are loyal to you. So if you're an indie author, which you love, I assume most indie authors love having the control. That's why you Mm -hmm. go indie. (laughs) And so by building out your team, you're able to take that control and just build that, that team for yourself. The thing with traditional publishers is that there are some things that I and indies authors cannot penetrate. So me, like maybe if I tried hard enough, I could, but I haven't had to like, you know, we're not getting co-op at Barnes and Noble or getting front Amazon ad, like front placement on amazon.com or, um, you know, some of the bigger distribution deals with that's very very expensive though isn't it right (laughs) it is well that's the thing but because it's it's like it's like our healthcare it's like because these big companies buy in bulk they can afford it in a way that individuals cannot and so I think that you know I've toyed with some like so I have talked to Amazon reps and BNN reps and tried to get like group deals for our authors uh, but it's still really expensive and then I don't really think that it actually will yield a return on investment And so there are some things that like we cannot do or we could, but it wouldn't make fiscal sense. So I think that's the, if you're looking at what you want from a traditional publisher, the marketing and the publicity is not that you're going with them because you want, first of all, you want, don't want to deal with distribution. You don't want to deal with the production side. You don't want to deal with the editorial side. Those are the things that you won't have to deal with with a traditional publisher. But again, you have a little less control. So like I, my book is traditionally, um, my, your book, your brand is traditionally published. So I had a really great edit, very happy with the edit, super happy with the cover. They did a beautiful job. I could not have done that myself. I couldn't even like imagined doing it. Like I couldn't even think about what a book cover would look like. Um, but the marketing and the publicity was nothing, right? Like they did not do, they did zilch. Mm -hmm. And so thank God I'm a publicist and know how to do it. (laughs) But like there were things that they had quote, they had promised that they did not deliver. So like one of the things when I sold the book to them was they said they had relationships with places like Writer's Digest and Salon.com to, to sell their books on those sites, which to me is really advantageous, like to have another retailer, um, especially something like Writer's Digest, that's very targeted. And that never came to fruition. And I don't have control over doing that. Like, I, you know, so mm. as an indie author, like, I don't know that you can get your books into Target or to Walmart. And so those are the things that for traditional publishing that they can do. So what I always tell authors, because I get a lot of questions about like, okay, should I keep publishing indie or should I try to go traditional or should I go traditional first? What should I do? And I always just say like, is your book made for a wider audience or are you going to be really selling to your audience? And if you're book is a wider audience, then a traditional publisher can help you reach that wider audience. If a, if your book is really to be sold to your people, like if it's like your platform, you have the readers and you're selling to them, then you should probably go indie because you're going to keep, you're going to have more of a cut. You'll make a better return on investment. So like the personal brand workbook was really created to give to my e-course students. And I, I did that myself. And I earned, or, but then I was like, oh, I could, it's in, I did it through Ingram. I was like, okay, I can just throw that up there. Sure. It can, sure. It can be on Amazon. Um, and I get, I make money off of that. And so I was like, oh, I actually, have, I think to date have earned more on that little workbook that like, I didn't think that wasn't really to like sell wide than I have on my, your book, your brand, because I only get whatever percentage of sales. Ah. So, right. So that, so you have to sell less to earn more. And so if you're selling only to your people, the math is better to do it yourself. You'll earn a return on investment quicker, but if you don't have a platform and you don't have 
an audience and you want to reach a, or you do, but you want to reach a wider, broader audience, then maybe do getting a traditional publisher to help you get your books into Target, into Walmart, onto the front table of Barnes and Noble, all of those things. But it is a crapshoot if that even happens, but that's your only chance at doing it. Mm. No, really interesting. I did want to point out that if you want your books in Walmart, you can do that through Kobo. So Kobo Writing Life, uh, you can get your uh, audiobooks and ebooks into Walmart. So just wanted to remind people about that. Um, but um, I, lots of people I know are now saying, OK, well, hiring a PR agency, much as we would all love to hire you, <laughs> um, is pretty, you know, it's pretty expensive for most authors uh, unless mm-hmm. they have a budget to get an agency. Um, so uh, you've obviously you've got your books, but you also have a course, your breakout book, which goes into how to do some of this yourself as an author. So uh, tell us about about that course. Yeah, so I have been for a long time figuring out how to serve authors who either couldn't afford us or who came to us when we were full, because we are full a lot. And so I, I we've this went through a couple iterations actually. Um, so we had I had just a self guided e course that did fine, but what I saw was people weren't finishing it. I feel like that's really common in e-courses that people buy and don't finish. And so then I was like, okay, they're not finishing. They need more coaching. They need more one-on-one support. So then I did a group coaching program where there was trainings and there was um, group calls every month. And that was okay, but I was getting tapped. Like I wasn't expanding that audience because I think because I was investing a lot of time in it and it was very tailored and, um, lots of my time that there, it was a higher price point. So that was, I think, hindering some of the authors. So I was like, okay, I need to find the sweet spot where I can coach people through the program, but also have that self-guided element that they can pick and choose what they want. The other piece of it is the e-course. I was constantly updating because like you said, so much changes. Like, so every time, you know, Instagram changed an algorithm or like a, you know, something changed on Facebook ads or, you know, Tumblr is obsolete now. Like I had to change all those things in the e-course. So I was spending a lot of time updating. And so I had the idea of, okay, we need a membership site where new content is being added and updated all the time. And authors can pay a monthly fee to have access to that content. So It is completely self-guided, although there is a live training each month. So a lot of the authors, so we usually get about half of the participants on the live training because they want the Q&A, but most people just watch the video afterwards. I think a lot of authors just really want to do it on their own or, you know, watch and learn maybe at night or, you know, power through all the modules on the weekends. So we have a, a live training every month and the community picks the live training. So I, I get emails from people. I put, I post a poll and people pick what they want to learn about. So it's very author driven. And then if you do want the one-on-one coaching, if that's of interest to you, you can upgrade and add on a coaching package where you can have unlimited 15 minute calls with me anytime. You just have a link. You can get on my calendar, even like this afternoon, (laughs) you can get on my calendar, um, at any time. So about, I'd say half the people right now opt for the coaching and then about, and then the other half are just doing the, the monthly membership. And it's been really great to see that the other piece of the coaching, the former iterations of this is PR takes time. Like this takes time. And also not everyone can work at the same pace. So what's been really great to see is that, you know, some of the authors who are really gung ho and right full time have made huge steps already and have I've seen success from the program while others are doing it slowly and like every month I check in and say like how's it going and they're like well I updated my website and I established my email marketing today or this month like that's that's great they're taking action and that's really what I wanted is to create a program that will not only teach but encourage people to take action so We've had one of our authors um, got a feature in Entertainment Weekly, which is awesome. Um, Another had a local event and was like the cover story of that small local paper, but like she was on the cover. Um, And these are all things that they are pitching. 
So it's, it's really, it's working, which makes me feel good because if it wasn't working, then I'd probably just shut it down. (laughs) Well, no, that is fantastic. And definitely having that um, sort of ongoing element is so important. So um, I think it's it's fantastic. I I think you, you are fantastic. So I do have an affiliate link to this because I think it's a good course. So that is thecreativepen.com forward slash breakout. And as ever links in the show notes. So um, I could pick your brains for ages, but we're going to have to call it a day. So where can people find you and everything else you do online? Yeah. So I would encourage you all, if you're going to sign up or even try out, um, I said it's a monthly fee. So if you do it for a month, if you tell me like, this is not for me, I I would give you a 30 days refund, totally fine. But if you do check it out, do do it through Joanna's link because you're going to get, you're going to help support this podcast and help support more people coming on and helping you launch your books. Um, and then if you want to just find me, I'm at kpublicity.com. That's K-A-Y-E publicity.com. And if you want to hear more about branding and networking and more of the entrepreneur side of me, um, that is at brandingoutsidethebox.com. Fantastic. And uh, your podcast as well, which is Branding Outside the Box, right? Yes. And our season premiere uh, just dropped today. So we do seasons September through June, um, where I interview entrepreneur, mostly entrepreneurs that tell us about their journey in small business, but also giving tips and tricks um, to help authors and entrepreneurs. So we have um, the folks from Pragmatic Digital, which is a voice marketing company. And I know, Joanna, you talk a lot about voice. Uh, We have people, Instagram experts, publishing experts. Joanna, you're going to come on soon. Um, And so, yeah, I encourage you to check it out. Branding Outside the Box, the podcast. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Dana. That was great. Thank you for taking the time. It's been great. So I hope you found the interview with Dana useful today and that it gave you some ideas for your book marketing. So next week, I'm talking about writing for audio first with Jules Horn. Now, this is a fascinating topic and I really think Jules has the first book on this topic specifically for authors as I have edited my own writing for audio, I have really come across things that need to happen. And as an audiobook listener, I've realised really some books need to be edited for audio in mind. And Jules um, has years of experience in radio and has also written plays, which of course are performed out loud. So you really get to learn what works out loud. And this is super useful information as it will help your book sound better when read aloud and improve your writing techniques around flow and also sound and rhythm. So that is fascinating. That is coming up next week. Happy writing. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time. <laughs>